Hello everybody. Welcome to the first of 11 beautiful lectures by Dr. Marnes. Um, everything that we talk about today, and we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. I'm sorry to have to, to backtrack a little. Okay. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff, and all of it plays a role in the way we interpret the New Testament. So, um, just want to let you know that we're not going to talk about anything that's irrelevant or um, anything that's peripheral. You know, all of this is at the forefront of our minds, you know, scholars' minds whenever we read the New Testament. So, that and more. You know, this is just the highlights. But uh, it's going to be very important in understanding the New Testament. Okay, first of all, uh, we've got to start with the uh, Vince Lombardi uh, method. You know, every I heard that every season he would hold up a football to everybody and say, this is a football. You know, he started from scratch every time. So we're going to talk about what the New Testament actually is. Uh, it's a collection, first of all, of 26 books and letters written between 55 CE and 150 CE. Now, this is the one of the periods of history of Christianity that we don't know very much about. We know a lot about what happened in Rome and even China and even in the Americas. But from 55 to 150 in, in Rome, Christians, it's a pretty, pretty dark time. And by dark, I mean we don't know very much about it. And what we do know about it comes from other sources uh, because you can't really, you can't use the New Testament to define the ancient world and study it. You know, because it would be uh, like only eating vanilla ice cream and, and saying vanilla is the best. You know, you don't know. You gotta have the outside sources as well. So that's only about a hundred a hundred year period, and uh, we're going to talk about how these twenty six books came together. In these twenty six books, there are four gospels: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They focus on the life of Jesus and his death, crucifixion, resurrection. There's one history, and we say history because it's written after the pattern of ancient novels, and that's Acts. You know, whenever I was growing up, we called it a history, but it's not a history in the way that we normally think history is, you know, like a recording and interpretation of fact. Um, Acts of the Apostles is a fanta the fantastic journey of Paul, and it's called fantastic because it's unbelievable. And there are elements of it that uh, just don't make any sense other than reading it as a novel. Ancient novel, not a modern one. There are seven letters that are undisputably written by Paul. These are 1 Thessalonians, Philippians, Philippians Philemon, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, 2 Corinthians, and Romans. How do we know that they are written by Paul? Well, I'm glad you asked. Paul had a certain vocabulary. He used a grammar that was distinct. And he uh, had certain theological uh, interests. And he knew of a certain form of the early church that are completely foreign in um, Ephesians, Colossians, and other epistles that were previously thought to have been Pauline. There are three letters falsely attributed to Paul. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And uh, I just got to say this. I don't know if I'm bordering on one I can't say, but um, 
whenever I was in my PhD program, there was a nun that taught um, New Testament. Her name was Carolyn Osick, and she's a very famous uh, New Testament scholar. And she got frustrated one day during a lecture, and she said, there's not a snowball's chance in hell that 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus were written by Paul. And I thought, you know, that's probably an exaggeration. You know, it's impossible grammatically and um, theologically and as far as church structure goes. You know, there's a different church structure in 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus than there is in Paul. It's a much more mature structure with clear offices. And, uh, you know, they might not have been offices that we think of in a, in a later term, but they are starting to have an organization that they didn't have in the, the Pauline letters. So there, are, so there are three falsely attributed, which means they're undeniably not Pauline. There are three disputed letters attributed to Paul, Ephesians, Colossians, and Thessalonians. I'm of the opinion that Paul wrote 1st and 2nd Thessalonians because um, that's what my mentor thought. And that plays a pretty heavy role sometimes. But, uh, you know, I just heard all the arguments for Pauline authorship, and it sank in so deep that whenever I hear arguments against it, I'm uh, not persuaded. Ephesians and Colossians, on the other hand, uh, I think are worthily disputed. And disputed means that scholars are arguing back and forth whether or not Paul wrote them. So if I want to write a paper on Paul, I do not cite Ephesians, Colossians, and Thessalonians when I'm talking about Paul because I don't want somebody um, bothering me about Pauline authorship and how irrelevant you know, Colossians is whenever you interpret 1 Corinthians, for example. So, disputed means they're, we're fighting against each other all the time. Not fighting, but disagreeing on whether or not Paul wrote it. The letters falsely attributed are called the Pauline pseudepigrapha, and people are not arguing about that. You know, these three epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, are so foreign to Paul that nobody, practically, um, argues that Paul wrote them. There's one anonymous letter, that's the epistle to the Hebrews. Uh, some early Christians thought that Paul wrote it, but it has a completely different style. So, uh, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. I know some people think a woman wrote Hebrews, and that's entirely possible. Um, there are three letters attributed to John. That's the uh, first, second, third John. They were written by the same author. And that author probably did not write the Gospel of John. Um, there are two epistles written by Peter, you know, first, second Peter, and there's Jude that one-page beautiful book, and then one apocalypse, which is Revelation. And I cannot wait, and I'm sure you can't either, until we get to that book. This is what the New Testament looked like. Um, this is from about 250, uh, maybe even 200, and uh, I think it's really cool because in Greek, just follow my mouse here, that's an, that's an Epsilon, Gamma, Alpha, and then L, L, I, Omicron, and then an N. That's Evangelon, which we get the word evangelize. It's the word gospel. K-A-I, just to use a transliteration in English, Kai, or Kata, sorry, K-A-T-A, -A, Kata, according. And this is an L, O, or U, a K, A, N. That's Lucan. So this is the gospel according 
to Luke. If you think that is cool, wait till you get down here. This is the next book in the Bible, Evangelion Johannan. That means it's a gospel according to John. And over here is in Archi Hologos. In the beginning was the word and the word and then I can't read the rest. <laughs> but uh, I think this is pretty awesome. It's written on papyri and it's it's from uh, one of the earliest manuscripts in the New Testament. And you can see a line right here. If I remember correctly, that's when they say uh, the scribes are telling us that something is uh, wrong in the previous text. How did it get here? How did the New Testament come to us? Well, in short, over the past 2,000 years or so, it's been passed down from generation to generation in Christian churches. And it's gone through a 2,000 year process of transmission, copying, and printing. And in the midst of all this, a whole lot of stuff has changed. You know, we have the illusion that uh, the New Testament is static, that is, it doesn't change. But whenever it's in human hands, and it's passed down from a worship community to a worship community, you know, the, the manuscripts deteriorate, you know, they get worn, and they need to be copied. And when they get copied, you know, the ancient scribes were professionals, but a lot of them weren't very good. You know, I... Uh, came across a um, parchment one time, and it said uh, the scribe, you know, whatever his name was, is illiterate. You know, like his, his writing is so bad that it's completely illegible. And a lot of stuff in the ancient world written by scribes is not legible. So you're having these... Uh, copy errors and uh, errors of the missing manuscript you know there would be a big hole in the parchment so whenever we get the printing press we almost get to a stable text but even then we have different committees and different um, scholars that piece together the text a little differently and uh, while it's on the computer, the NIV is always going to be the NIV. Nobody's going to mess with it. But back in the day, they just had the, the parchment and, or the papyri. And when they made changes to it, the next scholar, the next scribe, would copy down the error. Unless he didn't like it. So, it's been a long process. This is a codex. You see it has three columns. A codex is a, is a uh, scroll that's been cut and transformed into a book. This is codex, you know, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but Sinaiticus, which is a codex uh, from Sinai. And uh, I can't remember why it's called that. It's probably because it was found there. But uh, I, I can't quite remember. But this codex is, is very, very interesting. It was in the uh, I'm thinking about something else. I'm sorry. But that's what an ancient Bible looks like. About 250. Okay. Now to Metzger, pages 17 through 70. The New Testament has two major backgrounds. You know, whenever we're talking about the religious and the social background um, and the even the philosophical background, they exist in two different major areas, and that is ancient Judaism and Greco-Roman culture. So there were two things going on in the New Testament as in the background and also in the foreground. 
it's Greco-Roman culture, which is a culture that the, that the Romans had, or and ancient Judaism, and they intersect. So it's quite difficult to uh, parse all of that out. The extent to, to which the reader understands these backgrounds will determine how much the student understands the text. You need to write that on your heart. The more you understand ancient Judaism and the more you understand Roman culture, the better you're going to understand the New Testament. So we better get to studying these backgrounds. Okay, sorry about that. The political and social background, see, told you political and social and religious are those three categories and now focusing on Palestinian, not just Judaism, but Palestinian Judaism, the kind of Judaism that Jesus would have interacted with. And we're going to start way back in 323 BC uh, with Alexander the Great. He conquered the world. Okay. He did not leave a successor. He had no heir. So his four generals took over. And uh, the guys that we are most interested in whenever we study Judaism is Ptolemy and Seleucid. And um, the Ptolemies, it was named after Ptolemy, the, the general, they were a little bit more tolerant of Jews, and the Seleucids basically just used them as a ping-pong ball. You know, and they, they fought each other all the time, Egypt and Syria. And in order to fight each other, they have to pass through Israel. So Israel just gets the the snot kicked out of them every time these two people, these two countries went to war because, you know, one, one time the uh, the Egyptians went down, they got, or the Syrians went down, they got, they just got their butts kicked in Egypt. So whenever they're going back home, they completely pillage um, Israel because Israel is a little, little country and uh, Syria is basically an empire, and uh, you know Egypt is really strong too. So it was not fun for Israel for a long time. So this is what led up to Palestinian Judaism: the unrest because of Alexander the Great, and the wars between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. And the small. I almost say insignificant. You know, they are insignificant in, in relationship to the numbers. Um, you know, Israel just got torn up. And I want you to see this, the uh, this last point here. These two dynasties fought against each other for centuries. And poor Judea is located right in between them, like I said. When these two dynasties went to war, they ravaged Jerusalem when they came and when they left. They're fighting each other. Armies needed food and supplies, and Judea was no match for them. Okay, now we get into something called uh, Hellenization. And if you don't know what that is, that is the culture of the Greeks uh, being spread it's a process of spreading it all over the world. Uh, Alexander the Great thought that the Greeks had the best civilization in the world, and that's why he he went conquering. He went to um, save the barbarians in these other, in other lands and spread Greek culture. So this process was carried out by the generals also. We followed him and their children and their children's children. You know, they um, they spread the Greek culture uh, within Palestinian Judaism. And so, as a response to this, we get the Has Hasidites, <laughs> the pious Hasidins. 
Hassens. Okay, you don't have to say it in order to know what it is. Um, they're the pious ones. They they clung to a conservative uh, view of Judaism, and they resisted the priests of the temple who were complicit complicit in foreign rule. You know, in order to control Jews, the thought was, and is probably correct, that you need to have control over the temple, which is their this the uh, focus of worship for the entire country was the temple at the time. So the uh, Greeks would put in uh, puppet priests in the temple and not priests who had an actual commitment to God. So the Hasidins, the pious ones, were militant conservative Jews. They allowed themselves to be killed rather than fight on the Sabbath. You know, they, they were fighting against the Greeks one time, and uh, they were hiding in a cave, and the Greeks came and slaughtered them because they refused to fight the Sabbath day. There was a gymnasium and a track. Now, I didn't know this until I was in graduate school. There was a gymnasium and a racetrack built just outside of Jerusalem, and the gymnasium and the racetrack, that is a foot race, they're very um, important in Greek culture because, you know, they have the Olympic Games and um, they enjoyed wrestling and all that other stuff. And in order to participate in these games, Jewish men sometimes would undergo a process of reverse circumcision so they could compete nude with uh, other guys and not be made fun of. And it was a sign of their commitment to the invading uh, Greek culture. Now, an important part of this, this whole thing was Antiochus Epiphanes IV. He came into power in 175 BC. It's about 200 years after Alexander the Great, um, he got really mad at the Jews because he lost a war with Egypt, and he did some pretty nasty stuff to the Jews. He forbade the ownership of Hebrew scriptures. He burned, had his soldiers go through and burn Torahs and kill those who had it. He had circumcised babies killed and hung around their mother's necks. And that's among other things. But I thought I thought you should know, you know, the level of suffering that the Palestinian Jews went through and before the abomination abomination of desolation. That's when a uh, Antiochus Epiphanes had a priest uh, sacrifice a pig on the high altar in the temple. This is December 167. And that changed everything. But before that, we see that uh, many Jews were Hellenized. You know, we have culture war going on. The Jews that want to save the, the heritage and the Jews that, that are assimilating into the stronger force. Uh, it's like if, you know, America invades Iran and, you know, we're just destroying them and uh, things go better for you if you adopt the culture of the invading force. At least that's the theory. Uh, I have a link here just in case you want to read up on the uh, reverse circumcision. Man, that's hard. They went through that because it was uh, they could get accepted more and they could buy their citizenship and they could avoid embarrassment at the gymnasiums and the baths. You know they're showing by doing that. You know people were naked in front of each other all the time back then. You know, it was kind of like France. So um, they they did that. Uh, just talked about Jewish priests and rulers were complicit 
they were puppet kings, puppet religious leaders. And it's from this context that the Old Testament Apocrypha is written. And it sets the stage for the New Testament. One oppressor is simply exchanged for another, the Romans. And Antiochus Epiphanes actually tried to make a deal with the Romans, but um, he was too crazy for them. Okay, now we get to the revolts. It started out as a, as a bunch of religious purists terrorizing the countryside. You know, they're kind of like the Taliban. Just go, they get in their trucks and they go out and beat people up that aren't following uh, the religion like they think they should. Uh, there was, it, they might have been, I'm going to skip this number two and go straight on to three. Um, they might have been just as bad as Antiochus Pisces IV. You know, the guy that killed babies and hung them around their mother's necks. Um, they just killed Jews for different reasons. You know, these poor people that are caught in the middle, you know, just trying to farm or uh, just trying to scratch a living in Jerusalem. They get killed under the Greeks. They get killed under the Jews. They get killed under the Romans. Very hard life. There was a bloody guerrilla resistance against the Romans, which was, or against the Greeks, which was mildly successful uh, sometimes. They were seen as great heroes when they restored the temple, and that's where we get the story of Hanukkah. Whenever they, they had candles only for, I'm not even going to get to that. Okay, rebellion against the Romans. Okay, they had a rebellion, I think I'm getting my sides out of order, so bear with me. Um, the rebellion against the Romans happened a little bit later. You know, we were talking about one that happened with Antiochus Epiphanes and the, the pig getting sacrificed on the altar. That started the, um, that started a, a, two rebellions, actually. And part of that rebellion was uh, cleansing the temple at the end. But they all died later. They all became, actually, the, those leaders that you know, went down the countryside and killing people. Um, they became heroes when they cleansed the temple. But then, whenever they got into power, um, they started doing exactly what the Greeks did. You know, they started killing Jews too. So, uh, you know, difficult life back then. And much later, the first rebellion against Rome, it was happening when uh, Nero was dying. And uh, Nero was famous for uh, setting Rome on fire. You know, he was a nutcase. But the temple was destroyed by Titus in 70 CE. There's a five-month siege, and uh, the suffering is just awesome. You know, uh, Josephus says that the blood was so um, dense and there's so much blood in Jerusalem that it went up to a, a, a horse's chest. And the Roman soldiers went around testing their blades on the dead and the dying. You know, they wanted to see how sharp their sword was or their spear, so they just they stabbed it into a dying person or, or a dead person. So uh, that was the end of the world for them. Then there was a barcode. Bar Kokhba revolt in 135, and that's when the Romans said, we've had enough, they, they flattened the temple, they kicked all the Jews out of Jerusalem, they renamed Jerusalem after a, a Roman name, and Jews were not allowed back until, or they didn't come back until the 60s, you know, um, or 1947. It just... Horrible suffering. They actually helped build the Colosseum. You know, whenever Vespasian took him back as prisoners. Okay, the Roman provincial system. Now, when Rome came in, they divided up the area according to their desires. And it's a lot like how um, the colonial 
the colonial colonies in Africa, you know, they were divided up according to what the British wanted, and the French and the Dutch. So uh, there was no consideration for the grudges that people had against each other and the kind of wars that were going to happen over borders. Well, you have a similar thing going on with Rome. They're, they're going to they have a, they're going to administer their rule uh, through a uh, you know establishing governors over various provinces. Now the empire, the Roman Empire, did not have a complex political system, and by that I mean they didn't want to think about things. You know they weren't Greeks; they were warriors, and they would rather just tax you and leave you alone. And if you, if you don't pay your taxes, they come and kill you and take your stuff. So uh, that kind of, you know, they're just blunt objects, you know. They, uh, they only cared about that. So Rome would ignore you if you paid your taxes. But if you stop paying your taxes, you start getting their attention. And you don't want that. They had a very complex system of offices based on patronage, which means um, a patron is somebody who's rich, who supports, they give patronage to a you know, person that's uh, beneath them socially and financially. And the person beneath has to provide a service or goods or uh, hold up some other kind of bargain with the uh, patron, and usually the patron will dictate what he wants from you. So, and then, you know, you don't get, you don't get the money that you need for life if you don't do what they say. And that is exploited in all kinds of ways, especially, of course, sexually, and, uh, you know, every other way. I mean, every way a person can be exploited. They also had a fairly complex system of status. You know, Romans were all about status. You know, going up the military chain of command. Um, cities, if you if you recall a city, it was a very high honor, especially if you were a free city. Um, you start out as, as a probably, I can't remember if a province comes first or a territory, but you have rights and privileges as a city based on your status and the patronage of the city, you know, what the city is doing for Rome. Languages in Palestine. The Romans spoke Latin and the Jews spoke Aramaic and Greek and some Jews read and understood Hebrew. Now, there was a development in Judaism. Jews forgot Hebrew and they spoke Greek because of the, you know, the Greeks were in control. And then after the Torah was outlawed by Antiochus Epiphanes IV, the fourth, um, you know, they didn't even have Hebrew to read. So uh, they stopped speaking it because everybody was speaking these other languages. So uh, they had to do something about that. Most ordinary people did not read, and they spoke more than one language because, you know, they're dealing with, if you're a merchant, you're dealing with Romans all the time, you're dealing with Jews all the time. So you're going to be, you're going to need to speak more than one language. Now, I want to talk about the uh, most ordinary people did not read because the literacy rate back in, you know, in this time period, in this area, was about 8%. That means 8% of the population could read. Yet, Christians are exchanging letters. How can this be? You know, um, why is Paul writing letters to people who can't read? You know, that's a, uh, an enigma. It's a, it's a, it's a paradox that, that people don't understand yet. Um, some people think, including me, that at least one person who have some kind of literacy, and they could read it to the rest of the church. And the rest of the church memorized it and carried the gospel all over the world. But we can't emphasize enough 
Um, we don't. We can't imagine a world where only eight percent of the population can read, and most of those were not were not wealthy necessarily. They were scribes and scholars, um, and uh, merchants. You know, people. The only people that really knew how to write were people that had to write, and those people sometimes could read, sometimes they couldn't. That's just how literacy worked back then. So. Um, we have to imagine these people as illiterate. And I think that's important when we're interpreting a written text. <clears throat> okay, culture and religious background of Palestinian Judaism. Yes, we're still talking about that. Um, the Hebrew scriptures were memorized usually by boys at an early, Jewish boys at an early age. Um, but they were going out of style. Um, other, other writings were very popular that were in Greek and Aramaic. Um, and you need to understand that there was no set New Testament, I mean Old Testament, until after the Septuagint, the LXX. And as you know, the Septuagint is called that because 70 Jewish scholars got together. They all translated the the uh, Old Testament independently, and they all came up with the same translation in Greek. That is a miracle, if it really happened, which, of course, it probably didn't. Um, there was no standard Old Testament until that was produced. And the significant thing is, the Septuagint was written in Greek. You know, we're talking about how the, um, excuse me, We're talking about how people were forgetting Hebrew, and the proof of that is the Septuagint, because Jews needed a Greek scripture so they could understand what's being read. And that was also, incidentally, the Septuagint was the Bible for Christians. You know, Christians were writing the New Testament in Greek when they when they used Greek. They're quoting the Septuagint. So, and not, then they don't quote it verbatim. All, I think all the quotes actually in the New Testament that quote the Old Testament are incorrect as far as the older texts go. Okay, our 39 book Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic, as we said. It was translated into Greek by Hebrew scholars in Alexandria, which is a Greek city in Egypt. Um, named after Alexander the Great, they uh, came out with the Septuagint, and it was begun in the 3rd century, 3rd century BC, I guess, and completed in 132 BC. And it's awesome. Okay, I, I really enjoy reading the Apocrypha, you know, both the Old Testament Apocrypha and the New Testament Apocrypha. Um, it's, it was included in the earliest Christian writings. and Well, not all of it, but some of them. Some of the Apocrypha. Uh, they are sacred writings not included in the modern Christian Bible. And the reason why they're not included in the modern Christian Bible is it costs too much. You know, the publishers of Bibles... Um, in the Reformation era, when they first came out with the printing press, they um, when they first came out with the printing press. They weren't making enough money on Bibles, so they cut the apocrypha out. And it's not written in Hebrew, which is why uh, it's considered you know, less than inspired, and it, the most important one is Maccabees. And Maccabees are the Jews that revolted against Antiochus Epiphanes when he sacrificed that pig. Um, we might get into that, we might not. Okay, we're back. Uh, I was interrupted, but... Uh, it was only a second for you guys. Okay, the most important book in the Apocrypha 
is the Maccabees. And those are the guys that rebelled against um, Antiochus Epiphanes when he, uh, Judas Maccabeus, or Maccabee, was the priest commanded to um, slay the pig, and he just started killing people. He was evidently a hoss, and uh, he had five sons, who, and then they, uh, they kicked out the Greeks and cleansed the temple eventually, and then they started ruling just as oppressively as the Greeks did. So just exchange one tyrant for another. Okay, the, this, these are the contents of the Apocrypha. Now, 1st and 2nd Maccabees was written about the Maccabean Revolt, and this is like the, the golden age of, uh, of Israel. You know, they're, they kicked out the Greeks, and they're taking back their land, the temple has been cleansed, and everybody's happy, especially if you're a Maccabee. And Tobit is a wonderful story about the importance of burying the dead. Um, it was written, the, the setting of the story is written um, when the Greeks weren't allowing uh, the burial of the dead. And so Tobit goes around, he's a hero, like an anti-hero, and he buries people. It's a really good story. That's actually the first book of the Apocrypha that I read. And Judith, uh, the, the point of that book is that God will defend his people if they observe his law. And Judith is a, he a heroine. I believe she kills a king. And then the Wisdom of Solomon, it's wisdom literature. Uh, it combined Greek philosophy with Judaism. So you see the theme again of the uh, Greco-Roman, which is a horrible term, but uh, the Greek philosophy, like Socrates, Plato, especially Plato, with Judaism. Everybody tries to do it. Christianity's tried to do it for a long time. Um, Ecclesiasticus is more wisdom literature. It's like uh, the old the Old Testament book of Proverbs, and then Second Estras and Enoch. Enoch is great. Uh, they are apocalyptic. They they are material, like Revelation. You know there is more than one book uh, written like Revelation, and so it informs us on how to interpret it. Okay, pseudepigrapha, it means false writings, or these are falsely, these are um, ma materials written after a person has died, for example, and attributed to them. It's kind of like uh, what people think about First and Second Timothy and Titus. They're written after Paul's death, but it's attributed to him. It's, it's an honor, and they didn't have copyright laws back then. So, uh, authors' works could be stolen and sold under a different name, or, uh, you know, you could plagiarize as much as you want to, but in the literary circles, like with Cicero and the people that read his writings, they could tell when something was plagiarized because they read so much. And so, um, they made fun of people that did that, but it wasn't against the law. So... We have a lot of pseudepigraphical material, especially within a group. You know, like Christians produced the Christian pseudepigrapha, or the Pauline pseudepigrapha. And then uh, Pythagorean, the Pythagorean pseudepigrapha, it claimed to be written by Theano, who was the wife of Pythagoras. And Pythagoras lived a long time ago. And Theano and other famous women wrote in the names in the names of these earlier women to give their writing weight. But we know because of the Greek that they used and the the material it's written on, we know that it could not have possibly been uh, original.
or written by an ancient like Theano. Like I said, Christian pseudepigrapha, their writings attributed to the heroes, uh, Peter, Paul, Mary, John, uh, basically everybody has some kind of pseudepigraphal uh, work attributed to them. And uh, it's how the, the uh, heretics uh, tried to gain um, credibility by attaching their teaching to an ancient Christian hero. And here in the uh, Old Testament pseudepigrapha, we have writings falsely attributed to Hebrew notables, notables from the Old Testament. The pseudepigrapha uh, contains the Assumption of Moses, the Sibylline Oracles, Psalms of Solomon, Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, Book of Jubilees, Histories of Adam and Eve, and, and the list goes on. And uh, these are actually uh, preserved by people of faith. You know, these, these writings survived, you know, all of the stuff that happened for the past 2,000 years because they mean something to somebody. So, or they mean something to a group of somebody's. So, just want you to know, in case you ever see these, uh, they're part of the pseudepigrapha. Okay, now we're moving from Greco-Roman uh, context to Palestinian Judaism. And we're going to actually, I believe, return to um, Greco-Roman stuff uh, after this. Sexed parties and classes within Palestinian Judaism. And here we'll see some familiar characters from the New Testament. The Pharisees. You know, everybody's heard of the Pharisees. They have an unknown origin. They were a small group of dedicated lay people. They weren't priests or ministers. They weren't people of the cloth. Uh, they were probably this descendants of the Hasidians. You know, we talk, talked about them earlier. They were called the pure ones who wouldn't allow themselves to be tainted by uh, Greek culture. They believed, now this is very important, when I have all, all the stars, I promise you this is going to be on the exam. Um, the Pharisees believed in the foreordination for of God and free will of man. So they believed that God determines everything, but also that man uh, has free will, and women have free will. So it, they, they were able to hold this dichotomy in check. They believed in the immortality of the soul, which is a Platonic theory, and the resurrection of the body, which is what Christians believe, and that you're rewarded for your good works. In the afterlife. They believed in angels and demons, and they recognized the supreme authority in religion was the Hebrew scriptures and the oral teachings of their leaders. So they accepted both scripture and tradition. And they believed in angels and demons, a lot like uh, is, in, is in the New Testament, and uh, the reward for good works after death. They're not bad guys. The Sadducees are a little different than the Pharisees. You know, the Pharisees were a small group of laymen. Now, this is a small group of ruling priests which were influenced by foreign powers. So these guys are in positions of power at the temple, which is a center of power, and they are controlled by the Greeks and later the Romans. Now, they are a small, educated group. They're sophisticated from the wealthy class. You know, they're in the ruling class. Now, they reject the oral tradition of the Pharisees. They deny that history is divinely controlled, and they focus on personal freedom. Now, that's really important, because if you're, you're focusing so much on personal freedom, you're able to change your destiny. And 
you can see that's a theological justification for reaching out to the people who are now coming into power or the people who have been in power and allow yourself to be controlled by them. They rejected the idea of resurrection and immortality of soul and they rejected the ideas of good and evil spirits. That's the Sadducees ruling class. Now the Essenes, we don't know a whole lot about them. Um, they are not mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, we don't think they married. They, they uh, had ritual washings like baptism. They believed in the coming kingdom. Now, they did not marry because they, they're fleeing from society. You know, they lived in a remote place away from everyone else so they could practice their religion. That's why we don't know very much about them. But uh, Josephus mentions them along with uh, Pharisees and Sadducees as three groups of Jews that were in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. So uh, the Essenes are very important with New Testament studies because it's another it's another Jewish religion that's happening or another sect of Jewish religion that's competing with all these other ones uh, although they're not competing very well because they're not in the city anymore. Um, now the Dead Sea Scrolls, I know everybody's heard about that, um, they might have been preserved and I think they were preserved by an Essene community. They're out in the middle of nowhere and the the uh, story is that the Romans were coming to kill everybody in uh, 135, I think, that was a year, and they hid their writings in caves near the Dead Sea. And I have a picture of it. And they stayed there for hundreds of years because the climate, the dry climate, uh, preserved in the cool air in the cave, preserved the uh, documents which were stuffed in jars. And the Bedouins, the shepherds in the area, were had a tradition that um, made them afraid to go up there. Uh, they thought that evil spirits haunted the caves. And that's why they survived for so long. And one day, some, a uh, little boy was throwing rocks into one of these caves and he heard some jars break and then uh, everything you know everything else is history they discovered scholars discovered it being sold in um, you know little bits of the Dead Sea Scrolls were being sold in the market black market in Israel and uh, a scholar tracked it down and it's uh, it's a beautiful story of intrigue. It's like a it's like a spy story. They're gonna make a Da Vinci movie about it. Okay, another group is the Herodians, and you can tell by the Herod part that they probably like the Romans. Um, they're apparently a pro-Roman group that was an extreme minority. You know, uh, not many people like the Romans. Uh, they, oh gosh. They're not supporters of the Herods. I am so sorry. Uh, and they're mentioned as the enemies of Jesus in the New Testament. Pro-Roman group that doesn't support Herod. Herod's still a Roman name. The Zealots. Yeah, I, uh, the Zealots would be familiar to you. Uh, they were Jews who wanted to fight and die to get the Romans out of Jerusalem and they cause problems with everybody else you know the zeal the zealots would um, they would kill some Romans and the Romans would kill Jews in response so uh, they were not popular and uh, they were kind of crazy and these are the folks who held out for three years at the fortress Masada uh, the Romans, Titus, the leader of the army, had to breach the wall. He had to build a dirt road, a dirt ramp, up, up a hillside. And when you, if you see it, if you Google it, Google image it, it's a fantastic accomplishment. 
And Titus built this with the zealots, you know, killing his men pretty much the whole time. And everybody inside at Messiah, uh, they all killed themselves. And there are maybe one or two survivors because we know what happened. You know, the uh, men drew lots and they killed their families and then they killed each other to the last man and he fell on his sword. And a two women, I believe, uh, escaped into a cistern, you know, big thing where they keep water, and uh, waited for the Romans to come. And um, it was just an amazing story of how, just how fanatic you can get. Now, today, or at least uh, whenever I heard it, I heard it five years ago from a, uh, it was an interview with a tour guide in, you know, a good tour guide. This was in a PhD class, so it has some credibility. Um, the Israelite army, whenever you're, if you're in Israel, you know, they have compulsory military service for both men and women. Part of that training is they take the recruits to the fortress Masada where everybody killed themselves and talk to them about how they need to be that committed to defending Israel. Okay, the common folk, the first thing you need to know is they were very, very poor. The people in ancient times were divided into two massive groups. Actually, one's massive and one is a little smaller. The wealthy and the poor. And the poor lived a, a subsistence um, existence. You know, they only lived from day to day. And uh, that's how Jesus grew up. He was fortunate because uh, he was a carpenter and there was good carpentry work. Uh, Sepphoris, which is a nearby city, uh, they were rebuilding. And uh, Jesus and his father, uh, or Jesus and Joseph, would go to Sepphoris every day. It's just a three-mile walk and uh, do their carpentry work. So that sh that probably allowed them to have enough food to survive, but uh, it was a hard life. Most people couldn't read, like we said earlier, and the lower classes were despised by the privilege. Okay, scribes and rabbis. Uh, I mentioned scribes earlier because, uh, you know, scribes were one of the few people that could read. And uh, they provided uh, dictation and other services. They worked for a fee most of the time. Um, you went to a scribe, like, if you, if you were wealthy and you're going to get married, for example, you would go and get a marriage contract. And, and the, two, the two fathers would get together and um, draw up a contract with a scribe. You know, the, scribe, the professional scribe would be writing because both men would be illiterate and, and, um, and certainly they couldn't write. You know, writing was a lot harder than just, you know, grabbing a pen and writing on a piece of paper. We had to actually have implements and, um, you know, more than one tool. So, scribes would offer these services out in the real world, and they also served kings, because, you know, kings wanted to write stuff all the time. And they, there, were school, there were schools for scribes. Um, there, we don't know a whole lot about schools in the ancient world, but we know that there were schools for scribes. And they, these schools taught different ways to make letters. And uh, you can tell... Sometimes, whenever you get, whenever you see a manuscript, you can see, you can say, "Oh, this came from Alexandria." You know, it has an Alexandrian um, slant to it, or this is from Athens. You know, they they have different writing styles in different areas, and uh, that's how we know they had schools. Um, sometimes a scribe had a second job, but there really was no need for them 
to do anything else because there's always work for somebody who writes in a culture where nobody writes. Uh, Hebrew scribes were called lawyers because they were highly revered interpreters of the law. All they did, if you're a Hebrew scribe, all you did all day, every day, is copy the law. And they started paying attention to what they were doing and were revered as uh, wise people. And they were wise people. You know, if you sit around and do that all the time. Um, and then memorization was a very, very important, was very important in teaching. Now, this is from the rabbis. You know, not all rabbis could write. So the um, memorization of scripture, memorization of the teachings was extremely important. Okay, the temple. This is really interesting. This is a replica of the temple, this picture here. And you can see the courts and the Holy of Holies. And, and the outer wall is way out there. You know, it's just a massive complex. And during Jesus' day, it was a sight. Uh, it was magnificent. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. And uh, I have, it was newly renovated by Herod. He did a lot of rebuilding projects around the Mediterranean. And uh, you can watch this uh, YouTube video where the guy who built this model um, explains it to you. And we have a close-up. And you can see people over here. <laughs> Synagogue worship, you know, everybody's familiar with synagogues, houses of worship for Jews. It probably originated while the Jews were in exile in Babylon. Now, this happened a long time ago. Um, the Jews didn't have the temple anymore because they were in, they were in Babylon, and they needed a place or a group to worship with, so they would get together and worship worship together in synagogues, which were probably not built, you know, they weren't buildings. You know, they, they could have been a home or meeting outside. It's like the idea of the church and the church building and the church people. You know, the synagogue didn't have buildings uh, for quite a while. It really took off after the destruction of the temple because there's no more temple and the people are scattered everywhere. You know, they can't come together anymore for communal worship at the temple because it doesn't exist. And there's nothing else that can take the temple's place. So it started out in homes, just like Christianity did, and then Jews dedicated buildings to the purpose. Uh, now this is what's really difficult with both Christian Christianity and Judaism. The earliest churches, the earliest synagogues, have no set form. That means whenever they first start, they move out of homes and start dedicating buildings for the purpose. Uh, all of them are different. You know, they might be taking over in a warehouse. They might be uh, taking over a house that's, that's a big house. Uh, you know, you never know what... A building was, you know, buildings have long histories um, in the ancient world, but no two synagogues were the same. So you can't, it makes it very difficult or impossible even for an archaeologist to go and find a first century synagogue because all the synagogues are different. You don't have another synagogue to compare it to. So um, that's something that, that's really frustrating. Uh, but patterns later did emerge, which is a relief. Uh, it was a center of teaching and prayer and reading the Torah, and the synagogue attracted many Gentiles. And this is important for Christianity because Paul, the, uh, these were low hanging fruit for Paul, because the Gentiles were not allowed to actually participate in worship. They had to stand outside and outside of the community. And, um, you know, they, they couldn't really pursue Judaism. 
And one of the biggest problems is the Gentiles did not want to give up eating pork. You know, they didn't want to follow the dietary traditions of Jews, but they wanted to follow the they wanted to follow everything else. So they were called God-fearers. And we have some God-fearers mentioned in the New Testament. Whenever Paul went to a city, he went straight to the synagogue and he recruited these Gentiles. And he says, you, you, you want to participate in Judaism? Well, here's some, a place where you can be equal with the Jews. You know, there's not going to be any more separation between Jew and Gentile. You know, so uh, these Gentiles were, um, they were low-hanging fruit. They wanted in already into the covenant, and Paul made that happen. Okay, I told you earlier we're going to return to uh, Greco-Roman stuff, and uh, this is the philosophical and religious backgrounds of Greco-Roman paganism. This is what Paul had to deal with everywhere he went. Now we're going upside down. And we're turning around. Plato is the most influential philosopher that we get out of Greece. Um, he's the most influential school in the history of Christianity. And the biggest reason for that is Platonism was very popular in the first century and, and on. Uh, the writings of these philosophers, especially Aristotle, um, were not lost, but they, they enjoyed a kind of resurgence in the first century. And Christianity was fighting for its life. And so we have several, we call them apologists. Uh, Tertullian is one of them. St. Augustine is a little later, but they tried to justify Christianity by saying that it, re it really is Platonism. You know, it's no different from Plato. We're going to apply all of Plato's philosophies and just Christianize it so we can, so we can be accepted by the intellectuals of the day. And uh, it never quite worked. Uh, and then I said, uh, many people who formed Christian theology were essentially Platonic philosophers. And Plato lived in 5th century, the 4th century BC, student of Socrates. He founded the Academy, the Center of Dialectical Learning. And uh, that's why most of his extant writings are in the form of dialogues. Uh, there are discussions. The dialecti dialectical form of learning, which is what I'm trying to do here, um, is learning through debate. And his central doctrine is that the true reality is not the transitory object. So the true reality is not, is not my hand, because you can see it. The true reality is the form or idea behind the object. That's why we say uh, people are in a platonic relationship, because it's not the object, it's the idea. And there's other things, I'm going to go back to Plato real quick. There's other things about Platonism that um, are very prevalent in Christianity. One of them is the idea of the immortality of the soul. Um, Plato explains in Timaeus that uh, everybody started out in a pool of existence and the gods separated us and we are trying to get back. And that's the immortality of the soul idea. You know, that your soul has always been immortal and it will, it will always be immortal, but your body will pass away, and that gets into reincarnation. But uh, that's something that is very prevalent in Christianity. Not the, not the many lives part, but the immortality of the soul. 
you know, you probably have heard that term in Christian setting. Epicureanism. Uh, he's one of my favorite philosophers. Uh, he's founded, um, Epicureanism was founded, of course, by Epicurus, and he lived about the time Plato died. Um, his school was a garden in Athens, and it was sort of a hippie commune. Um, they just kind of hung out. Uh, they accepted women and slaves, and his education wasn't just for the ruling class. Um, you know, I say hippie commune because um, the it was just cool. You know, women and slaves hung out. It was a it was a utopia, uh, the garden, um, and people accused him of all kinds of immorality because he accepted these people. It's kind of like Jesus, you know, accepting all people. His atheism is very interesting. He's probably, he's one of the only ancient atheists. Uh, he thought that because the, uh, of the situation of, of uh, life on earth, that if gods existed, they were evil. You know, he took the natural world as proof that God didn't exist. And there was a large Epicurean community 50 miles north of Corinth in the first century. And we know that because um, I can't remember I can't remember how to pronounce his name, but there was a very wealthy Epicurean um, philosopher or a follower of Epicureanism, and he built a massive wall and monument to Epicure, Epic, Ep, Epicurus, Epicurus, and y'all going to make fun of me, but uh, he made a massive um, Dodges of Oneonda is what it's called, it's in a very remote area of Greece, you know, the guys that go there, they only go like once every five years, because it's so hard to get to. It's just a it's a difficult climb. It's hard to get supplies out there. But uh, during Paul's day, I guess it was a little different. But there had to have been Epicurean, Epicureans in Corinth because this other community was so, was so thriving and so close. Um, their emphasis is on pleasure and happiness. And it's also on uh, emphasis on the atom. They concentrate on the smallest part of humanity that they can possibly get. And they build on top, they build on it, you know. And they were, they were sorely scorned, made fun of by other philosophers because they concentrated on the small parts of life. And, uh, I believe Paul Paul actually uses the word atom. Um, Christians incorporated Epicurean ideas concerning friendship, you know, accepting all people and loving all people, uh, and openness to women, you know, those women in the early Christian churches, children and slaves. So the idea that everybody can come uh, certainly uh, made an influence Christians. And they uh, accepted other Epicurean ideas. Now, this isn't as popular to study as Plato and Christianity. Um, I guess Ep Epicureanism has been uh, neglected, but there, it's coming back. Stoicism is a, kind of my speciality. Um, it was founded by Zeno of Citium in Cyprus. It they it's called it's called yeah it's called stoicism because they met in the stoa they met underneath an overhang um, outside uh, that's where they held that's where Zeno taught um, one of the most popular philosophies in the ancient world uh, it really addressed the problems of ancient life you know in the first century men and women had statues made of themselves wearing Stoic uh, philosophers' dress. 
Um, I thought that was cool. But it, it happened all over the Mediterranean. And the idea is, uh, if, if you're a Stoic, you're, you are self-sufficient and you're invincible to all the trials of life. Now we've talked about a lot of times in the ancient world where you know you suffer war, uh, people come and, and pillage your country, and you have slavery and hunger, and the Stoics taught that all this external stuff you can control, you can't control, but you can control what happens on the inside. So it's very practical, you know, external, internal you can control, external you can't. So that's where we get the idea of self-sufficiency. And the invincibility part is taken up by Paul. You know, you've heard that, I know to, how to abase, I know how to abound. And I know how to hunger, I know how to be well-fed. Uh, that's him, that's Paul embracing the Stoic idea, the idea of the Stoic wise man, and applying it to himself. Only he didn't follow the Stoic method. He followed a new Christian method, which is trust in Christ. And, and he's able to embrace this self-sufficiency, so he has credibility with the most popular philosophy in the ancient world. Now, Stoics are often considered to be pantheistic, because uh, that means God is everything and everywhere. And uh, sometimes it's true, sometimes it's soft. You know, they only talk of one God a lot. But they believed that there's a certain kind of divine nature running through all things. And we live according to our nature as human beings, as, as humans in this um, continuum of, of divine nature. You know, we live according to that, we're going to live according to reason, and we're all going to be okay. Um, animals and plants and other creatures, they live according to nature in a different way. Like a dog is supposed to be a dog, so you don't get angry if the dog barks. You know, um, a flower is a flower. It can't be a human. It's not going to have reason. So they have a very high, uh, a very high anthropology. Like they think of humans as very special. Um, Stoicism deeply influenced Paul. I already talked about him embracing the idea of the Stoic uh, invincibility, but he used their diatribe style, which is not an angry rant, but it is a form of argumentation. You know, it has a, a clear uh, beginning, middle, and end, and they do it in a certain way. So scholars have been have compared uh, the diatribe, especially with Galatians, and they can identify different parts of speech that the Stoics used, and also Stoic morality. The idea of the wise person; these are in influences by Paul, and popular appeal. Uh, so that's Stoicism in a nutshell. Cynicism. It was founded by Antisthenes. I don't know why I cannot pronounce anything tonight. Uh, and Di Diogenes of Sinope was the most fa the most famous cynic. Um, we don't know much about An Antisthenes, but uh, Diogenes of Sinope is a wonderful character because he doesn't care about anything. You know, the uh, whole idea of Stoicism is complete separation from the world and you neglect society and you just return to nature. It's like Stoicism gone mad um, because the Stoics participated in society. You know, they encouraged each other. Uh, when they're self-sufficient, you give more. So the self-sufficient man or woman is going to be a better leader. And so they embraced society and the cynics achieved self-sufficiency by neglecting society. And you can see that in the most extreme ways with Diogenes of Sinope. Um, he 
rolled around in his barrel. He lived in a barrel. A lot of paintings that you see um, will have uh, Diogenes in a barrel. Um, and whenever Alexander the Great was coming to Corinth to to conquer it, uh, everybody was was uh, running around and doing this and that and you know freaking out, uh, hiding all their stuff. And Diogenes made fun of everybody by getting out of his barrel and rolling it around Corinth. You know, uh, <laughs> if you could just imagine that. And then he told Alexander the Great uh, to get out of his son. Uh, Alexander the Great came to Corinth and uh, he found Diogenes because Diogenes was was pretty well known and he uh, he told him you know what do you think about this and Alexander the Great's shadow uh, went over Diogenes and he said get out of my way, get out of my son and whenever he was being sold into slavery one time uh, he said uh, he pointed out someone in the audience and he says that man looks like he needs a master so just a really interesting character and there's more you know the sex in public with his wife Hipparchia uh, that is just crazy but um, he did it so Cynicism is a complete separation from the world, and you return to nature. Now, an excellent example of this is that he slept in the baths during the winter, and the baths were where you went uh, every day. You know, it, it was a social gathering place, and it was a place where people were decadent. You know, they, they were enjoying uh, themselves in all kinds of debauchery, and... Um, they are conducting business, you know, everything happened in the bass. But it's a very social place, and it's a place where people, a lot of people have fun. Uh, and so he's sleeping there. He's not having any fun. He's going in the winter, he's sleeping there. And in the summer, he slept in the, uh, out in the open, in the forum. And then he's also known for defacing money. You know, that will tell people that, you're not into society. You know, you're not going to uh, trade with anyone. You're not going to use the money to your benefit. Uh, you're going to deface it, destroy it. And the cynics are often shown in art by having a staff in a bag. Um, they were traveling teachers, uh, and they, they were hermits. And the cynic, cynic means dog. Um, they are, uh, Dogeny said, he's like a barking dog who nips at the heels of everyone. He goes around criticizing people. And, you know, we kind of view a cynic as a negative term. And Diogenes got on people's nerves. Do that. Uh, Pythagoreans. Pythagoras is a very interesting character. Um, this has a this the Pythagoreans have a tangential but uh, important impact on Christianity. Um, but Pythagoras has an important impact on the reception of Christianity. So in the in the formation of Christianity, he's not that. Uh, important, as especially compared to the Stoics and the Epicureans. But the reception of Christianity, uh, he, he was very important. And you say that because Pythagoras wasn't all that popular. You know, he only taught his family, and all of them uh, were persecuted. So uh, the teachings were passed on from mother to daughter. Which is which is good for me as a you know I'm a student of women in philosophy, and the the original Pythagoreans you look down here, uh, they died out within just a few hundred years after he lived, so Pythagoreanism was lost, 
And it, and then when in the first century, whenever um, philosophy was becoming uh, popular again, he surfaced. Now he was the first person to be called a philosopher, and that means lover of wisdom. Philo is love. Sophie is wisdom. Philosopher. He was known for having an amazing memory, and because he was uh, had such a good memory, he was able to convince people that he'd been reincarnated. You know, he, he could remember all this stuff because he's remembering past lives. Um, he claimed to be raised from the dead and claimed to be reincarnated, like I just said. Um, he went down into a cave, and he stayed there for a while. Uh, and his mother, his mother snuck food in there, and then he came out of the cave, and uh, you know that's his resurrection from the dead. Now there's a collection of sayings called the Golden Sayings of Pythagoras, the riddles that only his father, only his followers know, and this is the kind of teachings that influenced Christianity because it was just one line of text and then an interpretation. You know, and the, the riddles are impossible to understand. It's, it's like, don't eat a bean, because a bean is a kidney. You know, we're going to be, and, and therefore you should be vegetarian. You know, uh, that's a horrible example, but, you know, it's stuff that's just, they're, they're riddles, but gosh, you can't, there's no way anybody can figure that stuff out. Um, he kept his teachings in the family, like I said, and that's why it, it died out. But Neo-Pythagoreans were emerging with Christianity, and they patterned their writings after the Gospels. So whenever, the, whenever Iamblichus wrote his life of Pythagoras, uh, you know, back in the day, he patterned it after a Gospel. I mean, it looks just like a Gospel. So it's kind of cool to see, you know, these ancient philosophies had an impact on Christianity, and then Christianity had an impact on uh, these philosophies. So it was just becoming popular, uh, like I said, whenever Christians were coming along. Okay, mystery religions, and then we're done. Mithras is the uh, most famous um, mystery religion, and uh, they're closely connected in today's popular culture. If you search on the internet for similarities between Mithras and Jesus, you're going to find a laundry list of things that are similar, or a lot of people think that Jesus is Mithras. So uh, it's kind of irritating from a scholar's point of view. Because Mithras, a lot of things in Mithras came, came about after Christianity. But nevertheless, many Christian churches are built on more ancient Mithraic sites. Now, I thought that was cool. But uh, I noticed that in studying archaeology of the ancient world, and especially of cities, um, the place where people put their garbage, for example, is a place where they always put it, you know, for years and years. You know, the, I call it a geography of place, or and then a spirituality of place, because their houses of worship are built right on top of each other. You know, like um, the altar at Ephesus to Isis is, I think it's Isis. Well, anyway, the, the high altar there in Ephesus, the foundation. Um, they've been digging down and they're not certain that they found the original foundation yet because it's been ever since that place has been inhabited they've built their house of worship on the, on that on top of each other. And uh, I think that's kind of cool. And, and so there's not necessarily a connection between Christian churches and Mithras. Because if you go anywhere in the ancient world, 
you know, you find a place of worship, there is uh, likely to be another house of worship underneath it because the people of the area always worship in a certain place. So uh, I, I just thought that was, that's really cool. Um, some people think that Mithras heavily influenced Christianity, but this is not based on historical understanding of either Mithras mysteries or Christianity. You know, in order to find all of the connections that people claim, you have to completely ignore history of Mithras and completely ignore the history of Christianity. Um, it, this is uh, the Mithras and other mystery religions, they have an initiation. Uh, it could take years to get in. And that did influence Christianity a little bit because uh, Christians didn't just accept people into the group. You know, they had to go through a year or two or more of initiation where they have to prove that they're going to follow uh, Christian morals and Christian theology. And then they have the ceremony of the Taro uh, Bolium, which is a bloodbath. And although I would never do it, I think it's awesome. Uh, because, you know, they believed that, uh, believed in all kinds of things. Whenever you, you, you get down into this pit, and there's a an ox above you, and the priest will cut the ox, and all the ox blood will just fall down on you. So, uh, for whatever that's worth. And I do have a video, by the way, of, of that uh, from HBO, the series Rome. There's a woman that goes through that ritual, and it's crazy. Even just, you know, fake. But uh, the Isis and Osiris mysteries are also very important in today's uh, popular culture. Um, and by that I mean the same thing with Mithras. You know, Isis Osiris is uh, a lot like the Madonna and Child. You know, whenever you see uh, the Madonna and Child, you know, the Madonna is holding the, the baby. Uh, that was all over the ancient world as Isis and Osiris. So uh, people think that there's all sorts of connections between uh, the Isis cult and, and Christianity. Uh, and then there's an idea of Osiris rises from the dead, so Christ rose from the dead, therefore they're the same. Um, it's, and it's difficult, it really is difficult to comprehend how popular this was in the ancient world. The Isis and Osiris images show up just about everywhere. You know, the little idols with the, you know, the woman and child. But they weren't mother and son, I don't think. Anyway, it's irrelevant. Um, the Dionysiac cult. Uh, this is another cult that people associate with Jesus. Uh, some say that you know Dionysius was the god of, of uh, ecstatic worship and wine, and wine is important in Christianity. So Jesus is the god, the new god of wine. People really say that. Um, and then dynastic ecstasy is linked to Christian speaking in tongues and charismatic worship. Uh, they did not have a good reputation with philosophers in even some cities. You know, the, that's where we get a dynastic uh, orgy. You know, they would be dancing around naked and, and doing all sorts of other stuff. So they were not, um, they were not welcome by the um, by the elite of the city. So whenever the Dionysiac cult comes through, hide your daughters and your goats. They're crazy people. Okay, the cult of Sybil. Um, this is another ecstatic uh, worship. People get in a frenzy and they're cutting themselves. And this is a religion where the priests get into a frenzy and they castrate themselves. And uh, I remember the first time I heard that. Yuck. But that's how they worship Sybil. 
and there is a celebration of the restoration of Attis by the goddess Sibyl. And the Eleusian Mysteries, another very popular um, cult. It commemorates the marriage of Persephone and Pluto. And in the rites, they symbolic, symbolically reenact the Demetra myth. And initiates are baptized and sprinkled with the blood of a pig. And that's it, folks. Thank you for um, attending the first ser first. I was going to say sermon. I preach a lot. Um, thank you for attending the first lecture. I hope that we have a wonderful class. I know that we will. And if you have any questions at all, please email me. I will be glad to hear from you.